Hello, everyone. Welcome to the talk. And I'm guessing that if you looked at the title before you came here, you're probably thinking one of two things. One, oh boy, we're going to make fun of lawyers. Or two, what do lawyers know about the digital frontier? As to the first, I'll just say, challenge accepted. As to the second, I'm not sure I disagree with you. Um, you know, if I think about the digital frontier, what you would see in my head is something sort of like this. And if I'm really being honest with you, it's probably not in color, it's probably more like this. In fact, my idea of the digital frontier on a day-to-day -day basis is figuring out whether my service desk will spit out the report that I need. But what if I told you that this year, I realized that my office, the Office of Legal Counsel, is a gold mine of data and that I can use that data, which represents work we've already done, to add value to our organization, essentially double dipping. It's true. And so that's what I want to talk to you about today, because even though you're not a lawyer, it doesn't matter. I think you're going to find that there are some things that you can take away to use the same sort of process for yourselves. And so let me tell you a little story. And for those of you that were in category one at the beginning, the heroes and the fools of this story are in fact the attorneys. So a little bit of background. You know I work for How Do IG. And in the past couple of years, we've been doing a little bit of a transformation. Now, we do the same work that other OIGs do. We do audits and investigations and evaluations. But what we've really honed in on under the leadership of our inspector general is focusing on the work, the right work at the right time. And that means figuring out what HUD's top management challenges are. What are their priorities? How do we select our work within those priorities? What kind of scope do we look at? What is our methodology? What kind of impact are we trying to have? And it's created a lot of change in our organization. And the legal team has been in this all the way, and we've really felt like we're one of the leaders along with the other components. Come March of this year, something happened. The Inspector General issued a memorandum that said we should focus on data literacy. And I'm like, what? What is data literacy? I have not heard that term. So I do what lawyers do, and I Google it. And this is according to Gartner, which many of you know. Data literacy is the ability to read, write, and communicate data in context with an understanding of the data sources and constructs, analytical methods and techniques applied, and the ability to describe the use case application and resulting business value or outcomes. Now for the Ozone Group One, yes, that does sound like a lawyer wrote that. And I understand all the words, and I think I got the pauses all in the right place. But I gotta tell you, when I hear use case application and data constructs, I think that's probably outside my wheelhouse. This was almost immediately confirmed for me. All of HUD OIG took a data literacy survey. So all 500 plus of us took us, answered questions, and they're not intended to say that someone's data illiterate, but rather to let us know sort of where we are between expert and nothing. And so, we had we used very positive terms for each of those. So if you were a data expert, you could really just do it all. You would probably be a data aristocrat. True, this is true. If you were very savvy with data, very comfortable with using it, you'd probably be a data knight. Now, down at the bottom of the pile are the data newborns, people that really, I think, probably have a distrust of data, um, have never used it. I am one step above that. I am a Data dreamer. I think we know what that means. I am a data dummy. And as an aside, for those who are saying that's pretty negative, you should come close shopping with me if you want to hear my inner monologue then. But I, I agree. I probably am a data dummy. And that's okay because I am a word ninja. And we have data analytics folks that are awesome. They can take down 100,000 records. They can do statistical sampling, and they can come up with information that's really usable, and they work directly with our components, our auditors and evaluators and investigators. And I thought, that's not my lane. Okay, I am good. Everybody's got their lane. Until I happen to look down at my performance plan. And way down there at the bottom of page three, it says we had to do the following. 
develop and implement a process based on data-driven analysis to address the strategic HUD OIG priority objectives and focus areas within the Office of Legal Counsel. Holy I have no idea what I'm supposed to do. I've worked in five legal offices. I've never done any of this. And in fact, I'm not even sure what a support office like the legal team would do with data-driven analysis or what they, where they would get it from. Okay, so shake it off, Mar. Shake it off. Gotta, gotta go forward. Gotta find a way. We can do this. We are lawyers. There's gotta be so. There's gotta be someone who's done this. We just have to find them and use their process. So I start where I usually start. I talk to my awesome deputies. And I say, "What do you know?" And they say, mm, "Not so much. I haven't done it. Right? Not done yet." So I go to my Siki counterparts. I call some folks. They call some folks. And again, no joy. And now I'm thinking to myself, okay, maybe we're all dummies. It seems like lawyers are very good at research and drafting really good products, and they QC those products very carefully before they put them out. But there's really not much in the way of using data on the back end. Okay, so we pivot. When I say pivot, I mean the legal team. We pivot and we go to other kinds of experts. We talk to our quality assurance official. We talk to our chief risk officer, and we talk to our data analytics officials. And they are actually extremely helpful in demystifying this process. And we walk away with some useful tips. First, what work do you do? That's where you're going to have data. Look at the work. There your data will be. And you probably want to think about where you might have some risk in, that, in those products. That's probably where you want to start. Also, think about what standards you're going to use to assess that data. And finally, Think about how much you can take on, i.e., are you going to have to do a sample? Okay, armed with this really good information, my management and team and I sit down and we say, okay, what do we got? Well, we do legal work. Where do we do legal work? Well, we certainly do it in all the areas that many OIG councils do. We do ethics opinions. We approve subpoenas. We provide legal opinions for audits and evaluations. We do personnel work and a plethora of other things. So. We decide that we're going to start with personnel. And we don't do some sophisticated risk analysis. We're dummies, remember, we don't know how. But we do know our work, and we do know that people are the number one resource for any agency. And so that seems like a good place to start. Plus, if you've ever been uh, involved in a personnel action, particularly a litigated one, you know the risk to the government you know the kind of resources it takes to bring these cases forward, and you know how hard it is on everyone in the process. So that's where we're gonna start. We're gonna look at all the personnel, uh, I'm sorry, all the performance and conduct actions. We're gonna go back three years, and we don't do a checklist. We say, you know what? We are lucky we have two very experienced personnel attorneys that have joined us recently. Let's use their experience to issue spot, have them look soup to nuts, let's start with the beginning proposal, go all the way to the end, look at any related cases, meaning any kind of uh, response suits, look at what legal counsel said, look at what HR said, look what was actually done. And so that's a pretty deep dive. And before I go into what the results were, um, I want to talk one minute about, about sort of personal engagements. So. As you may have guessed, this review really isn't going to focus a lens just on OLC. And so we immediately reach out to our HR counterparts. They are a very important relationship that we have. And we say to them, would you collaborate with us? Would you give us your feedback? And to their credit, they leaned in and helped make this a success. So it's very important to think about who's going to be engaged in this and, and how you maintain your relationships in these processes. Okay. So we, we decide we're going to do this review. It turns out to be 90 cases going back three years. It takes three months for the two attorneys to do, to do the look for it. Well, the final report's not written, but we've already got some really interesting results, right? Turns out we were actually worked very well with our HR counterpart on each of these cases. And there are a number of good practices. There's also some areas that, that provide room for thought. So when do cases get mitigated? if they get mitigated. Who's doing it and why? Um, 
what happens if HR or legal either disagree or don't, don't think that the proposal is the best option? It may not be illegal, but it's not the best option. What processes are in place to handle that kind of discussion? Um, and then, of course, a very mundane but, but um, important issue, we realized we really actually keep, need to keep better documentation, right? So that's all really good food for thought. And I, you may say, you know, that was a huge project. Who can have, who has time to do that? Who has people to do that? And I agree with you. We were very lucky that we had um, the bandwidth and the people. We really wanted to do a deep dive. And honestly, we couldn't really figure out how to do a good cross section. Remember, data dummies. And so we did do a very deep dive. But here's the thing. We would have done something. Even if we couldn't have done this kind of depth, even if we didn't have these kind of experts to help us and fill in our gaps, we would have done something. And I think the, the leadership moment, if you will, is that we just jumped in and tried. We didn't worry about whether our process was perfect. And we didn't worry about we were looking at the data just right. We didn't know how. But what we did is step into the void. And I give a ton of credit to my fellow management team and to the attorneys who did it for being to, willing to step forward and figure it out as they went along. The results of this is that we have all this interesting information. Does it mean we're gonna train people? Maybe there's, there's a training issue there. Maybe there's a gap we wanna fill with the procedure, but now we have data and we know where we might have risks or liabilities. We know where we may have used a process in one that would be really good to put into place for all. So we really added, really adding value to the operation by just looking at the data we already have. Now, I'm gonna talk about one more review we did. And it's really short. It took maybe two days to do, but I wanna mention it just because it's a very different kind of review and it yielded kind of different results. So HUD-OIG, IG, the Office of Legal Counsel gets key TAM cases. And if you don't know what that is, a key TAM is a lawsuit filed by a private person that says, this entity or this person is making false claims to the government. And we get all the ones for HUD. And I'll, I'll just give you an example. So a loan officer may say that their former company, which is an FHA approved lender, is filing false claims with HUD on, on defaulted loans. Probably more than you need to know. Our role in it as OLC is very limited. The case comes in and, and the Office of Investigations has to decide whether they're going to investigate it and they work with the Department of Justice to see if the Department of Justice will take the case. So that's my tutorial on key tent. So we have limited information. We really only have what the case was about, what program it was in, how it turned out, and what location it is. We say, let's just look at it. So we dug up about three years and we figure out that of the 62 cases we got in those years, 52 of them are in two programs out of 70 HUD programs. Now, the first program is a rental assistance program for folks that are low income. All of those cases dealt with instances where the landlord was getting paid a subsidy by HUD and was gouging the tenant for extra rent. The second program is the FHA mortgage program, the one that people go and buy their first home with, that sort of thing. That was a little more varied, but all of the issues came up where the borrower had defaulted on the loan. And you may know that sometimes those loans get modified, sometimes you go to foreclosure, sometimes there's a, a claim to HUD. That's good information on both of those cases. That tells you where there's known areas of fraud. And maybe you're going to go do more work in those areas. All that for a couple of days work. Now, you may have guessed that we're probably going to keep doing this. And there's no cookie cutter here that we can follow. We're going to have to figure it out and we're going to get better at it. And so I guess if there's a, 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 a lesson at the end of this story, it's this. You really don't need to be a data ninja. You have the work that you do and you have the data that goes along with it. The data is a function of the work you do. Anybody can take that work and look at it and add value to it. So I may still be a data dummy, right? But here's the thing, I am now a data convert. So thank you.